much for attending again. Um, so I'm going to be presenting now on uh, planning for autumn and then touching on a little bit of uh, legume information as well, um, considering the current climate for fertiliser prices, but also a lot of interest around legumes um, currently and moving forward as well. I'm going to move on to some um, pastures for production now. So look, this is sort of what I sort of go through when I'm sitting down talking to people about planning for pastures. We've talked about, you know, we want to get paddocks in order in terms of our growth rates and cock year and, and thatch levels and all that sort of stuff. Um, but now we need to start to switch to autumn phase and um, what does that mean and how do we get the most out of what we're trying to... We're spending a lot of money on these things, so let's try and get the, the best result we can. Um, and, you know, there's a, you know, a lot to be done and a lot of things to take into account. Um, some things we have control over. I recommend that that's what we focus on. There's some things we don't have control over. And, um, you know, that, that's usually to do with weather, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, look, you know, we need to make a, a sowing plan, um, you know, depending on paddock selections, what paddocks you've got, you know, hilly, undulating, topography, um, you know, soil type, et cetera. Um, we need to look at, you know, perennial pastures as well and whether they're going to recover. And, you know, through the drought, we had a good discussion after this and which ones would recover and which ones wouldn't. Um, I talk a lot about, you know, KQ and trying to get KQ, um production going. And, and we've got to be careful which way we sort of look because some people will select pastures that are struggling. And, and let's say we've got a KQ paddock that's got some crabgrass, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you need to make a decision of what you're trying to achieve, okay? So we, if you've got a paddock of that and it's a bit thin in KQ and it's got a lot of crabgrass or nutgrass, et cetera, et cetera, you need to have a good discussion about well, where do we want to go? Is that paddock? Long term, going to be kikiri, or is it some paddock that we um, are happy to take out, and it can be a summer cropping paddock, for example. Um, but you need to have those discussions because that'll have a, an effect on where you put that in your pasture plan. And an example would that be is if you've got a kikiri paddock that's 30 40 percent kikiri, and it's got a lot of rubbish, and it's got a lot of um, you know nutgrass, crabgrass, etc. Um, you know, and this is just my my thoughts as well. Not not everyone's going to be in this boat, but my thoughts are, and if you want that paddock to be kikiri, you've, you've got to actually think about it around the other way and say, well, it's not an opportunity to take it out. It's an opportunity we need to look after this paddock. So if we're pulling that out in March and February. Um, you now that plant's going to be knocked about, especially if you're going to spray it all the way through to winter and, and summer, uh, late spring next year. So we're only going to do more damage to that pasture. Okay, so. My, my um, ethos on that is to, to try and get people to go select those paddocks to probably be sown last. Yes, they're going to have some rubbish in them, which we can deal with. But if we can allow that KQ to spread, get through and go into late autumn, it's going to be a better KQ pasture next year. Um, so from a long-term point of view, you need to make decisions around trying to match that. Um, we want to look at you know plant growth, germination, how we're going to achieve that, uh, matching feed demands, optimising the resources. Um, so sometimes we, you know, we'll sit there and look at how we want to feed plant to match when, when we don't have feed for, for animals, et cetera. Um, but if that's not going to match our environment, okay, if we've got a, we want, um, you know, winter rainfall, uh, winter feed, but we don't get any rain in winter, like there's no point trying to focus on it too much. And, and I see a lot of that, that people will see a graph and they sit there and go, oh, that's when I want the feed, so I'm going to plant that. And it's like, well, that's okay. But if you don't have the conditions and environments in your situation or the soil type to do it, you're not going to be able to achieve that, okay? So we want to match up. So those things like rain, soil type and landscape that we're going to achieve those things and use those resources that we have to try and achieve that um, production period. Um, sowing type, you know, whether you're going to be spreading, aerial sowing, um, you know, using double disc planters, single disc planters, whether you're going to be using tines, cultures, et cetera. Uh, will all have an effect as to timing of sowing, uh, depth of sowing, and the type of pasture species you can use as well. So quick feed options, um, as opposed to, you know, the longer sort of feed options. Grazing management and rotation management, um, you know, what are spring and summer plans for next year as well. You need to make that um, as a part of your plan. Um, and I think this one here is, I sort of, I reckon, uh, you know, John Mulvaney and uh, Phil, um, probably you know got my focus on this a probably a bit more is is the complexity so it's quite easy sometimes to to whack a pasture in and say that this is what we're going to achieve out of it but if it's not going to fit your system and it's going to add complexity to your feeding systems and transitioning animals and and all these difficult things that we've got to manage in the system 
Um, sometimes it's probably not the best thing. It might be the best thing to do on paper in that paddock, but it might not be the best thing to do um, while we're trying to do that in that system. So um, I've just got a screen up over me. Uh, I don't know how to get rid of that. So when I'm looking at sewing, I, I try to get my, um, when I'm talking to people, you know, to focus on four things, okay? So if we focus on light, temperature, moisture, and nutrients, to try and achieve those things the best for the plant to establish. So we're always looking for light because the plant needs to see light. If it doesn't see light when it comes out of the ground after germination, um, it's not going to be able to keep, create its own carbohydrates to live, okay? Now, that's really important in a year like this when we have high thatch levels and, and pasture that's out of control and we're looking to sow some winter pasture in. So if we even go out there and put some um, and, and put some new ryegrass in and we mulch over the top, a big, thick mulch layer, that pasture is not going to be able to see the light when it comes out of the ground. So always think when this plant comes out of the ground, is it going to be able to see the light? Okay. So managing those thatch levels is really important for that. Um, temperature. We need nice warm soil temperature for microbial activity, mineralization, and also for um, soil germination. Um, if it's too hot, it's, you know, seed germination can be affected. Um, but you know, the germination quite often um, can can be affected, but it's not the main cause. A lot of the other causes when it's too hot is the plant to be able to respirate. So when it comes out of the ground, it physically can't take enough moisture in through its primary root, so it can't respirate. Being a um, temperate plant, can't get that. The enough moisture out so it sort of cooks itself from the inside out but temperature is really important and i always say to guys especially if we're sowing early um you know have a look at that 10 to 15 day forecast and is there any heat waves coming and if there is put the planter in the shed shed and uh, wait for it to go on and hopefully some storms come behind it and you can crack back into it and an example of that i see quite often um with, with a farmer that uh, gets this right he has his seed in the shed he's all organized he's got his planter all serviced when he gets the conditions, it's not so much about dates. It's when he gets the conditions of cooler environment coming and he's he's comfortable that um, he's going to get it up and going, um, he'll go out and do it. Where the other guy, and he might have had some rain, the other guy next door um, is not organised, hasn't got his seed, probably hasn't serviced his machine or he's waiting for a contractor. And then by the time that he actually gets the seed, gets it sorted, there's a heat wave coming, he plants it and he seems to lose it and he, and he blames everything else and... The bloke down the road has, has uh, got success and, and away he goes. So temperature is really important. Also for if we're spreading seed. So if we have seed that is, um, you know, spread and just sitting on top of the ground or even sitting on some thatch, if we've got air around that, air is your enemy, okay? So we want soil to get around that seed so that it's got moisture to be able to use to germinate. Um, if it's got air around it, it's going to dry it out, okay? And it's not going to be able to germinate. So we want, you know, if we can get down into the soil when it's hot, get that soil around it because that soil also gives you a buffer for temperature because if it's 30 odd degrees outside, um, if you're in the soil, it'll be a bit cooler because it's buffered um, compared to being open into the, into the atmosphere. Moisture, obviously we need moisture. Okay, so if we haven't got moisture to germinate, the seed isn't going to initiate. Uh, the seed needs to first take moisture up, which then initiates uh, germination for the plant and then it expands and takes up to, to want to grow. Nutrients, we've, we've talked a lot about nutrients, but we do need nutrients, especially phosphorus early on in its life to get that root development, to get it going. Um, all this, you know, what's gonna impact on it, you know, high thatch, stubble, all these sorts of things are gonna affect our, our light, our temperature and our moisture. Um, and I've even seen in dry conditions, um, you know, in sowing sometimes, if we have a late dry summer or dry autumn, um, with that little bit of mulch um, that goes over the top is really helpful it holds a bit of moisture in there and stops that that drying out as well so just keep thinking of those four things when you're trying to get that establishment um so loose soil sandy soil will, will also affect um your germination and and what time you can sow um paddocks with silage removed are definitely going to be you know a lot easier to get established than um paddocks that have a heap of thatch and uh growth as well um and like i said the seed spread on the top is um Thing. The one thing we don't talk enough about is, is sowing too deep. And I've probably seen a bit of this over the last couple of years with wet autumns is this, if we're using not just ryegrass, but if we're trying to get chicories and clovers and all these small seeds up, you know, a centimetre in the ground is all they need. They, they don't know they need to be any deeper. So um, quite often I get a call and say chicory hasn't come up or clover hasn't come up, et cetera, et cetera. 
and typically it's due to sowing depth and it's just been sown too deep. Um, right, uh, so that's that's that. So when I'm also talking about planting, we, we need to look at which paddocks we're going to be planting early, which ones are mid and which, which are late. And we usually try to split this into three parts of the farm, okay? Now, if you've got a QQ farm, you can you split it up into three. Sometimes you've got some cropping um, on your farm as well, which makes it easier because most of that stuff goes in early, which is great because, you know, you've got those paddocks already selected. So you know, some are cropping paddocks. Paddocks are selected really early planting after silage. So where we cut that silage and we remove all that trash, like I said before, that have stumped that paddock. We've taken all the growing points away from that summer pasture. So it gives you a perfect opportunity to get some uh, established as well. And, you know, if, if you're um, that way inclined, you can also use some herbicide options to slow down the summer pasture as well. Um, so, you know, you, they might have your mid uh, planting stuff, maybe your later summer crops, your perennial pastures cut for silage or hay to conserve as well. So these are, you know, your next rotation where you're sitting there going, I've got some you know, good conditions and I've got some more silage. We're going to go straight back in there. Again, you can use some uh, herbicide to slow that up. Um, but once we're getting to the late, late stuff we're sort of getting now into you know may um late april um you know this is where you you your better kikuyu paddocks that you've got um you're rotationally grazing on them for the quality of the feed going into the autumn while you're waiting for your your early stuff to get up and going and typically these paddocks we will have one day one day feed on or one night feed on and then we've started feeding those early paddocks so now these get fed behind or sown behind the cows um, as well so the whole idea is just trying to set up a plan so that we can actually, you know, get some good feed away um, and, and get it established really, really well. Also keep that quality of feed of our summer pastures growing into the autumn. And the other one I always suggest is that we rotate those paddocks around, if you are or quite you, so that we're giving them a rest as well. Because if we keep taking the same paddocks out early every year, I can guarantee you're going to end up with um, weeds and, uh, you know, a poor QQ stand that's going to um, affect your production as well. Okay, so I just wanted to move on to some stuff that um, is, is really timely and it's going to be, um, I think, a, a potential issue this year. Um, whenever we get really good growing conditions, we also get a build-up of insects and pressure um, in those pastures, which is fine because that's nature, okay? There's plenty of stuff for them to eat. There's a lot of dead and rotten material. We get a lot of um, insects and mites and et cetera, et cetera, trying to you know, decompose all that, that material which is fantastic. Um, the one warning I would like to put out there is if you are looking to, to sow early, um, and when I say early, it's always hard to, to say a month, but you know, if you're going before the middle of April, uh, my recommendation is to use a, a seed treatment on um, your seed, um, just to give you that some of that protection for about 30 days post sowing. Now, if you get enough insect pressure, no matter what you do, you're not gonna be able to control them. But as you can see here, this is a demo site that we had in Taree. Um, no, this is the exact same seed out of the same bag. Okay, the stuff on the right, we treated with Poncho Plus, which is an insecticide um, treatment, which gives, gives it a bit of uh, protection from biting and sucking insects. And the, the seed on the left wasn't uh, treated at all. And you can see there the difference. Now, both of them were, were pretty knocked about by some insects. Now, that was you know sprayed out with some Roundup. Um, there's not a lot there for anything to eat. So as soon as that ryegrass plant comes up, it says, uh, thanks very much, I'm going to take you. So I'd recommend um, doing that. And some of the data that we've done here at Tauri uh, through local land services um, showcases this. And if you see here, you've got um, your variety of uh, ryegrass at the top. So there's Concord 2 or there's Diamond T. Now, one of them's an Italian and one's an annual. So we just looked at two different uh, types just to see if there's any difference. Then we've done, if we glyphosate the... Um, and it's just only 70, 70 uh, grams of active of glyphosate. It's a real low rate just to slow up the QQ. Okay. So if it says it's glyphosate, it's been treated with glyphosate. If it's nil, that was direct sown into QQ. The next one is um, a insecticide spray over the top. But on the x-axis down the bottom, um, this is the seed treatment. So as you can see with the orange arrows, that's, that's the ones that have been treated with the Poncho Plus. Um, and what we tend to see is especially the paddocks that got glyphosate, okay, so they slowed up that QQ growth, okay, um, they, they had a big response to the insecticide. And we've seen this for two years out of the three. 
Um, and that's you know, my, my gut feeling on is that is there's not a lot there from NEAT. We've, we've removed a lot of the green material. Um, this ryegrass plant's coming out of the ground and it's getting absolutely nailed, um, where that seed treatment is just giving it a little bit of um, protection um, going forward. So it's something to think about um, moving forward. Any uh, questions on um, sowing in autumn or seed treatment, etc.? Josh, that last slide, it looks like that was a pretty late sowing in that trial. Your harvest isn't until the 4th of July. I'd have to look at the sowing date. There was, I don't think that one was too bad. I think that one was um, April, middle of April. Right. So yeah. a lot of people are thinking, Josh, you know, sowing late February, early March. Yeah. You'd you get wear, a, you you to summarise, a summarise, would you say, you know, if you're going that early, that the, 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 the treatments are more important, in your opinion? Yeah, 100%, mate. And out of those three years, there was two, I think it was 16, 17, 18, Peter Bill, you might be able to correct me, but I think it was 16, 17, 18. Um, the, the middle year, um, which would be, yeah, that's 16. So the middle year of 17 was um, delayed sowing. Um, and we never got a response. So that was sown three weeks later than the others. So the other two were sown on the 10th of April. The delayed ones were sort of early May. And that was due to a flooding event. Um, you couldn't get on the paddocks to sow them. Um, but, yeah, definitely that timing. So, any, you know, we were seeing this result in the 10th of April, um, Neil. So, if you're looking at February and March, uh, to me, I think it's uh, it would only get a higher result. Um, and the, the, the stress and the impacts of heat stress and also insect pressure are probably higher then as well. It's an additive. Yeah. Good point. Thanks, Josh. Okay, so moving on, um, you know, and, and Neil, I'm really keen for you to, to add in here as well, and, and Peter and anyone else that feels like they would like to. Um, there's been a lot more talk around legumes, um, especially with nitrogen prices and also feed quality um, issues as well. And, you know, maintaining legume content in pastures, it's good. Um, it improves the forage quality um, and also will improve, improve the um, animal performance, especially when our grass pastures are um, getting past their best, um, our legumes will hold on to quality a lot longer. And also when we're starting to go reproductive, so with our ryegrasses or, you know, once we're starting into the late period with the kaikia as well, um, it will improve the quality of the feed um, during that period of time. You know, they typically got low NDF, um, they're high in protein, okay, so good, good quality protein. Um, now that low NDF, good protein, good energy, um, it's going to help increase the intake. And I guess, um, you know, I always talk about chicory and how it can, you know, really help improve intake um, in QIQ systems with the quality of it and low NDF. Um, our clovers are definitely going to add to that as well um, going forward. And the ability for it to fix nitrogen, um, you know, the ability for our legumes to fix nitrogen, anywhere from 20 to 30 kilos of nitrogen per uh, tonne of dry matter, is nothing to sneeze at and um, definitely in the current market is um, definitely well worth to have have in there. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, you, you drop everything you're trying to do and change the system and just go all clovers. Um, we know that there's some issues around trying to get clovers established and, and in our production systems and high high production systems as well, as Neil alluded to earlier, is we, we really do need to see a lot more research and information to try and help us get a bit more of a handle on these annual systems and, and how our legumes can support that. Um, going forward. Um, so as I, I've already mentioned this, but yeah, look, it can really help um, widen the window over that quality feed maintain. Um, in my view, this, you know, and, and please add to this anybody, you know, we've got three main important, you know, uh, you know, things we need to try and get to try and get good clover um, persistence in our pastures. Um, we need adequate soil for tiddling. Um, whilst you know, a lot of the clovers can go down quite acidic. Um, there's some issues around different parts of the, um, the clovers that can cause some issues around whether it's available, um, et cetera. And, and phosphorus and, and sulfur and potassium are, are really important in that, that scenario. So, you know, we want to be using soil tests to work that out. So we need to make sure that our lining's up to date and we've got a pH range that is going to be conducive to, to trying to help our clovers um, and our other pastures um, to perform at a level where you want them to perform at. Okay, so want to be above the 4.5 uh, pH for calcium. Um, and 
our soils, aluminium below 20%, and adequate pea and sulfur, um, especially sulfur um, for our, and phosphorus for our legumes are really, really important. And our molybdenum and for um, our rhizobia bacteria is really important as well. It uh, requires that. So if we, we don't have that in the soil available, um, you're not going to get the fixing of the, the nodules to be able to allow that to be available. And as you can see from that screen on the left there, I just wanted to showcase, you know, the pH range and um, when the molybdenum becomes and, and sulfur becomes available. And as you can see, like, you know, we, we're shifting closer to that five and a half, six um, to try and get some of those things to, to try and become available to the plant at a, at a, um, at a good rate to be allow our legumes to, to um, support the pasture as well. So we need to, you know, yes, we're happy that legumes can fix nitrogen for us, but we need to make sure that our soils are conducive for legumes to be able to persist. Any thoughts on that, Neil or Peter or anyone? Josh, I think that the molly is a big one that a lot of people probably dropped off doing, particularly as they've gone over time to using high analysis phosphorus fertilisers and less super. Yep. Um, used to be the old tradition to do your molly, you know, every four or five years. Um, I don't think we should discount boron and copper from, from the important legume function. And although they're available in the acid soils, we actually know that the base levels in a lot of our coastal soils are actually very, very low. Um, so we shouldn't discount those. Um, some really good stuff there, Josh. And I think I think the other the other really big thing I think in and not just maintaining. Are we going to talk about establishment as a different point to maintaining, Josh? Or because establishment's critical. And I guess the things that we need to be really thinking there are some of the stuff you've covered already on 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 uh, treatments and inoculation. But, but also I think we've, what I've seen generally in the past is that the rates that people use of legumes are too low if they want them to be a substantial amount of the pasture, particularly in year one. Yep. Um, if you're putting in red and white clover now with the thought that it's going to give you anything through winter, you, you, you're probably going to be disappointed. It may be there in spring and it's more likely to be there summer than the next year. Yeah. So... So it's either much higher rates and backing off your grass rates, or if you're chasing real legume activity in year one, particularly in autumn and winter, you know, integration of annual legumes into those programs. Um, and, and much higher rates, but backing off on your ryegrass yeah. to accommodate that. Yeah, we've got a slide at the end where we, we've got a, a list of some legumes, so maybe we might um, touch on some of those things, um, establishment, et cetera, um, when we get to them. Neil, it's a good point. Beautiful. Um, so look and look, use of improved legume varieties. Um, there's there's a lot of um, more proprietary and and um, bred legumes out there available um, on the marketplace now. Um, also, your white clover is looking at you know whether you want uh, the small leaf, medium leaf, or large leaf. Um, typically, your smaller leaf are the more persistence type, uh, more prostrate. Where your larger leaf are a bit more erect and um, I find the large leaf in, in what I've sort of seen, um, you know, compete better with the KIQ and, and the higher production systems um, that we have in our dairy systems, where, you, where your smaller leaf really is suited to your um, more your um, extensive sort of um, systems out there as well. But with the new breeding of those medium ones, they're really sort of starting to come along um, in the dairy systems from what I've seen in New Zealand, especially um, going forward. Um, Josh, can I just ask a question? Sorry, yep. I did yep. just miss a few minutes there, but um, just with your white clovers that are perhaps more naturalised in pastures and, and checking for nodulation, if there's, um, I guess there's two things really, isn't there? Is there a rhizobia absent or um, are things like molybdenum actually not there to help support yeah. them? What, what, do you, what do you think in that instance? Yeah, it's a good point, Sheena, and... Um... There's a bit of research done down at uh, Sydney Uni I was looking at the other day, but because um, they, they're seeing patches of clovers where they where they come away as well, and sometimes that can be due with fertility, um, you know, from from urine or etc. And, and dung and etc. as well. So again, going back to that fertility side and molybdenum being a part of that, and and as Neil said, some other things around copper. But as you can see there, that just wanted to bring that photo up while you're talking about it. Is that there's your nodules. 
um, on the road. So you can, you can dig your roots up and have a look. Um, you can also squeeze them and, and they should be a little bit pink um, if they're very active as well. So, you know, if you're pulling up legumes and you can't find those sorts of things, um, there's probably a good chance that they're not really adding a lot of benefit. And Peter, you might have some, some more data around that, but um, it's definitely um, an issue and something we probably don't know enough about, Sheena, um, yeah, to be honest. Okay. Yep. But, yeah, definitely dig some up and look at it. Um, and that's the only way you're going to tell if, if it's actually doing it for you. Yep. Um, the other one I see too is, and I've actually seen it and I've got a photo of it, but I didn't put it on here, but um, I've put some lucerne and red and white clovers um, in some mixes on Oxley Island, just in strips. And you can see the difference in the kikuyu and the and the, the greenness of it. So we've got all these urine stains and deficient pastures at the moment all in this paddock, but where these legumes are in, in the kikuyu, the kikuyu is actually quite healthy. So instantly that's telling me that those those legumes are fixing some nitrogen and supplying some of that to that kai kiwi pasture as well. Uh, did you, yeah, so good question. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention as well is, is the improvement on some of the red clovers, um, one for persistence, um, but also lower estrogen uh, varieties as well. And the breeding in swords, not monoculture. So a lot of the breeding has gone away from clovers now from, from monocultures because that's the way we used to do it. We used to put all these clovers out, see which one produced the most, and that's what farmers wanted, so that's what got put to market. Um, what we found is when we put them in, in these high production systems with high um, ryegrass and kikuyu and um, fescues, et cetera, et cetera, they just weren't performing to where we thought they would because they're not good at competing. So now all the varieties that are coming through um, are typically being bred in swords so that then you can actually look to see you know, how does it compete in a, in a modern you know, high production system so that uh, they can persist a bit longer rather than uh, getting overtaken when they get a bit sooky, not being in a monoculture. So that's, that's a good change going forward, I think. Um, this is just one slide I've pulled out of um, DLF have been uh, nice enough to allow me to share this. Um, again, you know, Neil mentioned that we don't have enough research and I agree 100% with him, but this stuff was done in New Zealand. Um, and it's just a you know, quick snapshot over two years of a, of a pasture that was sown with an, uh, a, um, that's an Italian ryegrass um, with relish red clover, and then the same Italian ryegrass sown by itself. And you can see there the difference in um, yield, right? So we're not even talking about quality, that's just yield. Um, you know, there's, there's over a ton and a half of feed extra um, by having that clover in that system. Now, Admittedly, you know, that's a, a low nitrogen input system. But as we can see, you know, if, if you're looking not put that nitrate out, um, you need nitrogen from somewhere and clovers are definitely a great option to, to do that for you. But just, to, just a quick one. Josh, it's pretty profound. It's 15 tonnes over two years. Sorry, um, yes, 15 yeah, tonnes. Not, yep. not a tonne and a half. Um, yep. Sorry, mate. <laughs> but look, it's, it is really interesting. I guess what we again need to get back to in these, this data is, is, you know, how did that reflect the rainfall there? But also, you know, what rates, what are these relative rates of actually getting that sort of production? Mm -hmm. And I think, again, it's this revisiting of the sowing rates. And look, just, just quickly going back to Sheena's question on the inoculants or on the, on the rhizobia, I think, you know, it's been a long time since we've seen actually a lot of dry land legume growth naturally like we've seen this year. Mm. Um, clearly, I guess we're, 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 there must be some carryover rhizobia in those natural populations. But I think one of the really important things is that the different legumes have different requirements for different types of rhizobia. So the white, you might have white, a white clover inoculant. Um, it's a different rhizobia type to all the annual clovers. So I think, you know, just because you've got white clover there, uh, then someone might say, well, I don't need rhizobia if we're going to put some annual clovers in that system because it might already be in the soil. You know, white clover, I think, is a, a type B inoculant, yeah. whereas the, all the annuals tend to be a type C. So you've got to actually have the right specific inoculant for the right clovers that you're using for it to be there in the first place. Yeah, yeah, good point. And um, especially, you know, if you are changing from those different groups and they're not typically available in the soil because of, you know, the, the past years or, or the systems you've had, it's, uh, it's a given, you know, we don't, we don't want to be on spending money on something that uh, isn't going to be able to do the job for us if, if we, you know, forget that package um, to go together. Um, 
I guess this is probably a bit about, um, you know, like you're talking about new establishment, but, um, you know, I talked earlier about, for me, legume establishment um, is a bit of a tricky one because we, we wanted to get established early, but at the same time, if we have summer pasture growth in our systems, I find that um, if we get, you know, cocky going through to, to June, um, which, which can happen if we get mild autumns up here, um, we don't tend to see a real good um, legume year. Um, however, when we, you know, get uh, an earlier winter and or drier later summer where the kaiku doesn't persist into winter, um, we can have quite good um, legume in spring. So, and also your grazing management. So, again, I've, I've seen guys, you know, put ryegrass with, with uh, legumes and overgraze it completely through the winter and, and nearly kill all their ryegrass. They get to spring and all they've got is clover. So, Again, it's a competition thing, okay? So um, manage the competition to, to get both species to coexist together is key. So grassing, um, shading is, is harmful, so we don't want to be you know, excessive competition. Um, Neil talked about back in, you know, potentially your rates off of ryegrass, um, if that's what you're trying to achieve, but understand that, you know, your first couple of yields are definitely going to be back if that's the case. There's plenty of research to show that, um, you know, sowing rate is really, uh, has a big impact on your first grazing yields. Um, your second and third, not so much, but definitely your first grazing. Um, uh, that's why you know, a lot of pastures really um, lack. And I, and I see this in a lot of dairy systems too, is when we're, we're letting our ryegrass in spring, um, you know, getting this flush of grass and we're not dealing with it. Um, paddock's going way past canopy closure. Um, really isn't, you know, the, the clover can't even get a chance to see the sun or get up and compete. So we're really knocking those clovers around and the ability for them to, to grow sideways and, and start to put roots down and, and style and nifts to do that. So, um, so they, they, they don't want to compete for light um, and soil nutrients because ryegrass and um, other newer species are really good at doing it. So we need to make sure if you want legumes that you, you're grazing to that performance. And to be honest, if you look at animals and grass and legumes and, and uh, look at all the rules for grazing, you know, they overlap a little bit, but they're pretty similar. So just try to get the right grazing management. Um, and focus on it, and, and it definitely will help your clover persist as well. Um, so establishment period, and I just sort of touched on that a bit, but the KQ part of it, establishment is really important, but any pasture. So if you've got a really actively annual ryegrass that you're going to put in and, and put in really heavy, um, that's going to have an effect on your legumes. Um, we didn't talk about it, and I don't know if I've got anybody, is your sowing depth. I talked about it a bit earlier. Is it doesn't need to be deep. Um, you know, centimetres heaps and we want to keep it nice and shallow and I'm seeing, you know, even Neil, um, you know, working closely with Neil and, and seeing what he does as well is now recommending to farmers to, to do their small seeds mixes and used to be done a long time ago and then it sort of went out and everyone sort of mixed it all together but I think there's definitely, if you're putting some oats and um, ryegrass and where it can go a bit deeper, um, putting your small mixes of your chicories and um, plantains and your clovers and legumes into a mix to try and allow them to just be really shallow on the soil is definitely worthwhile. Um, spend a lot of money on them. It's worthwhile trying to do the right thing to get them established. Um, shading of the stalloons, as I said, especially in that um, spring period with the ryegrass and also through the summer in Kaiku is really going to affect on the, the um, ability for it to um, persist um, as well. Um, yeah, I've already talked about early spring. So moving right forward, so what, what legumes, you know, to discuss, there's a lot more than this. I, I guess, Neil, I just put sort of, you know, we, we could be here for a week, but I just thought we could quickly just run through these sort of five. If there's a couple of others we want to add, that's that's no problem. But, you know, to me, loosen um, is, is something that's probably underrated. The coastal environments is hard because sometimes we have aluminium and aluminium at depth, which can cause some issues with, with loosen as well. Also waterlogging, okay? So if we've got paddocks that we want to that are going to waterlog, Loosen is definitely not something that uh, you want to be putting in there. It does not like wet feet at all. Um, however, there's definitely pockets. Um, you know, get that uh, self-draining soil um, with, good, with good nutrition. Um, you can get loosen established and, and be in a really good production system and mixed with chicory can be a great summer feed. Um, so I think it sort of gets skipped over a lot because it's typically known as just hay and that's it. Um, there's some newer varieties coming out that are more focused on grazing pressure and, and grazing tolerance, um, which I think is definitely going to help with the, the hoof trampling and, and damage that we get um, 
from our intensive systems, Neil. Uh, no. Thoughts on Lucent? Oh, look, Lucent, I think, can have a, a terrific fit um, in, in, in those sort of pastures, those, those mixed pastures. I think there's nothing worse nutritionally, and I think you alluded to it beautifully in one of your earlier slides, Josh, than having a paddock of five hectares and a, a Lucent only. In a in a in a sixty hectare farm, and all of a sudden you've got to say, well, "What the hell do I do with loosen for three days?" Yeah. You know, once I've fixed the bloat and the cows and and yeah. and the acidosis, um, then they're out of there, and then we can readjust them and trash them again a few weeks later. So, I think I think if you're looking at loosen based pastures and you're setting them up as part of your grazing rotation, you have to be mindful that you need to set up enough to have a constant rotation of them. Um, it has to be a significant amount of your farm that you've got. A grazing, a day, every day of the season when you're using them. Otherwise, they're, they're hugely problematic uh, yeah, and more yeah. so than the clovers, I think. Yeah, in, in no, it's, a great, it's a great point and, and something that um, I've been working on with, with a few guys, Neil, is that trying to get enough into the system is, is really, really important. And I guess where I see a good fit for those sorts of things is in our system when we have such hot, humid conditions and cows don't want to eat, um, being able to go and have have um, uh, feed of, of these type of pastures to get that higher intake when when they don't feel like eating a lot or they've mm. only got an hour or two to do it and then go sit under the shade for a bit, um, definitely can add to that, that system. But you're right, um, you, you want to make sure you've got enough of it. Otherwise, the transition on and off is going to do more damage than than not having it at all. So. Yeah, no, and look, they're, they're hugely productive, Josh. I mean, we, we collect that a lot of data on these pastures, probably over 10 probably 14 years ago, I think, when we did that work. And um, their quality attributes are extraordinary. Um, you'd need to be really careful with, with managing cows on them um, as part of a rotation. But they can be highly productive and nutritious, and, and um, it's actually good sometimes in these very high levels of kaiki on these farms to have that as an alternate feed once a day in those systems. Oh, that's loose. So what about red clover? Um, Neil, like red clover for me, it's um, you know it's more that spring, spring summer, summer growth that you're going to get. Okay, um, I always see when I'm talking to, to farmers that, and, and I guess like I always say, I always learn off other people what they've taught me. So, you know, farmers when I first come to the area would always say that you know they put red clover in for ten years and they'll see it one or two years. So, um, it's yeah, and it's yeah, such that conditional, conditional, you know, environmental is really going to have an impact. And your grazing management and time of year as well. Huge on red, and 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 we've seen it. It's a hit and miss thing so often, and, and it's traditionally and received in that. And I think that's that's backed by what we've seen. Some years it's extraordinary. Some years you may see one or two plants, and and a dip at the same planting rates, and we and and you know what we think are the same conditions, which clearly aren't. Mm. So we need to to better understand that. Um, but look, I do look. I am pretty interested in some of these newer varieties of red clover and and i think we, we know a bit more about establishment too i think you know seed depth that you've touched on appropriate fertility and again if you really want them to be there not not over competing them with the, with the grasses and there's as you said there's some trade-off there so. yeah good point um so we have white clover um perennial um there's, there's different types you got a lot of small leaf medium leaf large leaf as i touched on earlier um, I find that the, the large leaf in these dairy systems do a pretty good job of being able to get up and compete in these higher production systems. Um, however, you know, some of the newer varieties coming through are those medium leaf ones, Neil, are, are seeming to definitely, I know in New Zealand, are starting to uh, do very well in those dairy systems as well. Yeah, and we, and we just need to keep in balance what they're going to be competing against here in summer compared to New Zealand. Is very different. I think, look, we, one of the seed companies has revisited Ladino, um, clovers, and I think we need to be thinking about where the Ladinos fit in in our, in our coastal environments in the Kaikiu system, just because the Ladino is it's like a white clover, much yeah. longer stem um, yeah. to the leaf and, and potentially capable of being more competitive in a dense sword or a, a longer sword. But I've tended towards medium to large leaf and dairy production systems. And again, just touching back on to that, um, the way they're getting bred now too in those those competitive environments, um, pasture swords, I think is a good thing because at least that way we're starting to look at them being able to compete with these more modern, you know, we, we look at ryegrass, for example, that sort of gets 1% to 0.8% a year increase in production and, and ability. So 
you look at that over 10, 15, 20 years, that's a fair bit of increased production. And, um, you know, the clovers have had to compete with that and starting to get these clovers now to be bred in systems where they're against these newer modern um, pastures. I think it's a good thing because it gets, gets starts to select for those ones that are going to be able to get up and compete in these higher production systems. Uh, I think that's right. Look, the white clovers, I think a lot of the time we need to think about the second year because that's when I find we really see their benefit in the second autumn, um, and particularly in combination with suppressor. I mean, if you've got a bit of white clover and you suppress kikuyu, it's the, the white clover proliferation in those situations in that second autumn was quite extraordinary. Pretty much like that photo, the second up from the bottom is what Correct. you would see. Yeah, yeah. Classic paddock that's been sprayed out of summer grasses with a bit of kike clover that you thought was there. Just comes away. Competition. Amazing. So just moving now to, I guess, you know, these are probably the, well, they're not new, but um, I guess they're starting to get a bit more runs on the board and be a bit more popular, Neil. And um, I know you're a pretty big advocate for Persians as well. Um, you know, the you know the annual type. So, you know, they, they've also got better waterlogging um, capabilities. Okay. So you've got Persians that, and, and in our conditions, when our soil moisture is the highest right at sowing, um, having that waterlogging um, ability to go through winter, um, I think, is where they stand up well and they probably perform better compared to our, our reds and whites and, and et cetera. We're dealing with that. So we're going to have quite high water moisture levels in that autumn period, which causes problem. Also, they, they don't mind the, the clay and the, and the acidity side and um, also the, you know, your pH range and, and really good quality feed still again. You know, like it's a, they're really good legumes. Uh, look, outstanding option, particularly in double crop systems, um, you know, really can can add substantially to the quality of that, that winter feed. The new varieties, if they're going in, you know, before the end of March, you will get substantial production out of them in the first winter. It's not a spring thing. Uh, look for the soft seeded varieties. I think it's very important um, because we're not necessarily looking for these to seed over for the following year. Just think of them more as a crop clover. Um, and look, they can be incredibly productive. But, you know, we're generally, instead of going in at 25 kilos of rye and five of mm. clover, we tend to get better production when we're moving back to about 20 of rye and 10 of these clovers, eight to 10 kilos per hectare. Um, and that way it will be substantial, assuming you, you have the right conditions for germination and growth. Yeah, yeah good points. Um, any more comments on, on those clovers or any others that, that we haven't got there? With the only one there that in coastal areas that, that people may be familiar with and have used is probably Bursine, yep. um, which has got a similar sort of profile to Persian. Um, yeah, the, I think, the, look, if you've got a bit of salt um, in some of that low country, the Balancer, I think, could be very interesting. We don't have a lot of good information of how Balancer is performing you know, in, in, in our area. Um, I think it's got a lot of potential, but I think we need to do the work on the balancer. Yep. Um, you know, we've certainly seen Persians and Bursums do particularly well, I think, historically. Um, look, if you're using clovers, other things that you really need to think about nutritionally, it, 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 it's just, you, you do need to manage bloat um, and, and bloat risk. So making sure you've got feed or water systems that allow that to, to be part of it. It's, it's one of those whole systems thinking things that, that if we're going to have a whole heap of clover, um, you know, our bloat preventative may be something that we need to think about further in the grazing cycle as they become part of the sword. So yeah, don't, don't forget about the animal health balance on this stuff. Um, just quickly, and this will be the last slide, what else do we um, want to look at? So, you know, we've got brassicas, um, which are really give you really good production early on, especially in that heat period. Um, they, they suit well with the oats as well, um, with the oats being high fibre. Brassica is really good quality. You just need to be mindful of, of what sort of brassica you, you choose and whether it's a short, medium or long or leafy turnip compared to long because you're going to have some issues around um, if you're going in too early. So make sure you're talking to the right people to make sure you, you select the right varieties. That are going to suit your system to, to plant with other pastures. Um, ryegrass, again, you've got short, medium, long, and you've got dips and tets and the tans. So um, depending on your soil type, um, your moisture availability, your system, whether you are looking for something that's short, you might be going back into maize or into some sorghum, et cetera, in, in late spring. So a short ryegrass is absolutely fine. 
Um, you might have some rolling hills that has really shallow soil type um, and a short ryegrass is absolutely fine because typically we have dry springs. And if you're not going to get the, the moisture or the growth to be able to grow anything up there, short ryegrass definitely suits that well. However, you know, on your mainly dairy platforms and where you've got better, better fertility, um, selecting the more um, Italian um, varieties that are going to give you feed right through to Christmas um, are definitely worthwhile, the extra money to try and give you that extra two to three grazings um, and also increase your quality of feed in that last two or three grazings as well compared to an annual ryegrass that will go to seed and um, be a lot lower quality. Um, wheats and oats, rye corn, barley, so your cereals, um, they're really good early on. They'll build up the first two to three grazings to give you some production early. Um, suit really, really well. Rye corn, when it gets cold, will perform better than the others. Um, there's some research to show that it does perform well in cold environments. So if you are sowing late and you want some production uh, pretty quick out of the box, rye corn is definitely going to give you that, that production as well. Chicory and plantain. Um, so here we're looking at um, you know, your chicory. is going to give you that spring, summer production and autumn. It fits in really well of a ryegrass IQ system because it overlaps their growing windows really, really well. Um, really high quality feed, low NDF. It really improves the, the intake and the quality of feed of your um, summer pastures as well. And if you're using um, varieties that really stand up to IQ and compete and get up in there, um, again, though, needs really good fertility to, to persist and go forward. Um, plantain is, you know, very much a chicory, but it's it's uh, um, going to give you that winter production. Okay, so it's more of a fibrous root. Um, will give you production through the winter um, and early spring, where your chicory is going to be more through the summer and autumn and late spring. Uh, we've talked about our clovers, um, tropicals, uh, Kikuyu, Pasmalan Roads, Premier Digit, etc. Out west, um, if you're going to be putting Kikuyu and things like that into to top up a pasture. Make sure you're doing it nice and early because it needs to get established. It's slow to get going. Um, if you're going to be doing it, you need to do it, you know, that February, March period. Um, I think my, my opinion is if you're starting to do it in April, um, you're not going to be able to build it up. The cost of those of Kikuyu is, is quite sometimes cost per probability too. My question is, is um, why don't you have Kikuyu is, and um, what management and systems going on? Because often I've been to paddocks and they say they want to sow Kikuyu. And you'll go to the fence lines and it's all Kikuyu. Um, so you sit there and go, well, what's happened in this system not to have Kikuyu here? Let's let's visit that and see what management structures we can put in place to try and get it to come back. Um, that's both them. So, yeah, look, thanks very much, um, everybody, for um, the contributions. Um, everybody, it's been good to have the chat and um, it's great to get um, everyone's points of view and, and discussion. Um, and, yeah, look forward to seeing you on the next uh, seasonal update. Thanks very much.